Welcome back, everyone. That was a wonderful panel discussion. Um, and now we are going to be moving into our last but certainly not least speaker of the colloquium. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deidre Grimm as a food justice advocate, social scientist, planner, and activist. Dr. Deidre Grimm is one who does not believe in defeat, loss, or excuses. She spent the majority of her life working on dismantling systems and activating equity worldwide, but her roots are deeply embedded in the South. She calls herself a lifelong learner because her mom and her grandma taught her that an education is something no one can ever take from you. Dr. Grimm grew up in South Carolina, where her passion for equality and equity took root at a very young age because of her family's dedication to activism and service. She is the wife of a retired Army veteran and mother of three sons and one daughter who have all taught her patience and diligence and have embedded her life even more in service to the community. Over the last decade, she has worked in nonprofits where she ensures that every person she comes in contact with receives a hand up. In her spare time, she loves to study the beautiful landscape Oh, excuse me. <laughs> she loves to study the beautiful landscape of Savannah, advocate for equity, and volunteer with organizations that work to change the trajectory of the next generation. Dr. Grimm is the CEO of Ivory Bay Community Development Corporation and most recently named the first Black Executive Director for Forsyth Farmers Market. Deidre believes that when she is working towards is much greater than herself. And just as Vice President Kamala Harris teaches, if you are fortunate enough to have an opportunity, it is your duty to make sure other people have those opportunities as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Grimm, and I'm going to let you take it away. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for staying with us. Um, this has been a very informative session. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, it is uh, 3.58, so I'm just going to give everyone the caveat. Um, my um, supervisor is here. Um, that's my five-year-old daughter. So if noise occurs, that's what happens. Um, but we, needless to say, are here to talk about the work. Um, and how we can continue to use research methods as a means to advance and address food inequities. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. So I'd like to take everyone on a roadmap. Um, but as a young lady said that I, I grew up in South Carolina, um, my background spans a lot of like um, uh, our presenters earlier today around urban planning as urban planning as well as um, public health. So I like to talk about words. Um, I'm a linguist. Um, my grandmother was a dean of business, but I like to talk about words. Um, one thing that I found interesting today is um, the young lady, uh, I believe her name is Fanika, said that she does not use the word empower. I love the word. Um, you know, empower is a word that I'm doing the best to erase from multiple vocabularies um, across the world. Um, the word empower implies that a person does not or did not have power. And this is highly inaccurate because especially people of color, they have always had power. We lacked political will and had systemic oppression and racism that kept us from actualizing power. So therefore, um, empower is not a word that I commonly use. Um, preferably, I use words like liberate, emancipate, and evangelize. It just really depends on what the topic is. And I can go in further detail later um, in reference to that. Um, I also don't use the word food deserts. Um, food deserts gives the assumption that um, these are a natural phenomenon, um, but food apartheid underscores that the inequities um, to access healthy foods is a result as, of, as, as a result of decades of discriminatory planning and policy practices. Um, so therefore food deserts is not a part of my vocabulary. Um, also food sovereignty. Um, the first young lady that spoke today, I believe her name is Dr. Jazz. She did 
a great um, explanation of food sovereignty, so I won't go through that. Um, food justice, uh, she also touched on that. Um, but I also believe that, as she said, healthy food is a right and that all people should have access to it, no matter their race or socioeconomic status. Um, but one term that I have been fortunate enough to um, work with someone to help coin was low wealth. Um, I use the term low wealth as opposed to low income because income and wealth cannot be used synonymously or interchangeably. Um, income is traditionally seen as a steady money coming in and wealth represents savings and assets that could sustain a family without additional work. Um, the COVID pandemic showed us very well that wealth matters and more importantly that wealthy people were more financially stable than the essential workers who bear the brunt of the crisis. So food is community and why do I say that? Well, I'm a Gully Geechee woman. I grew up outside of Charleston, South Carolina, which um, is a place called Walmala, very small. But if you ever saw the show called Gullah Gullah Island when you were younger, that's my home. Um, the Gullah Geechee people are descendants of Africans who were enslaved on rice and indigo plantations and, and on the Sea Island coast where cotton plantations flourished. So it goes all the way from Wilmington, North Carolina to a little bit past Jacksonville, um, Florida. Um, in that spiel, I mean, excuse me, um, our farming was how we lived, right? My ancestors' diets consisted of foods that were locally sourced, such as vegetables, um, okra, rice, yams, bene seeds. Um, if you ever go to Charleston, get some wafers. Um, and foods that were introduced by Native Americans, such as corn, squash, tomatoes, and berries. Um, my mom, she was a farmer, even though she was a dean of business. Um, she didn't grow just enough food for our family, but everyone who lived around us. And so food helped us as a people to build relationships and a means to barter for services if our household did not have the expertise. And one thing that I think of as food is food is relational and food is love. Um, I believe that food is an, I mean, love is an action word. So therefore, equitable access to nutrient dis foods is very imperative to the sustaining of not just your household, but our neighbor's household and for generations to come. So I liked how Fanika talked about gardening, right? Um, our community's uh, gardens were staples. Um, historically, each community member had their own gardens, but unfortunately, there are now few and far in between. Um, gardens were used as a tool um, to, to help ensure that households did not go hungry. Um, here recently, I've been able to see that there has some, been some movement where my generation and the next generation get very involved in the land and working the land and understanding that the land is power. Um, here recently, unfortunately, um, across the water in Hilton Head, South Carolina, there's a one of our elders who is fighting to keep her land um, from developers. She tilled that land for, she's about 93 years old now. She tilled the land since she was a child and now they're about to take it. And so unfortunately, um, heirs rights uh, and heirs property has been plaguing our community. So we lose those at astronomical rates as well as black farmers are dying off um, faster than any other um, farmer. I also see this movement in, in growing our own food and self-actualization um, of Kuji Chagalia, which is one of my favorite um, Kwanzaa principles. Uh, my youngest son was actually born on the day of Kuji Chagalia, so that's probably why, why it was, it's my favorite. And so it speaks to self-determination and that we must ensure that we take our power back into our food system. Mm -hmm. Also, low wealth and minority communities are plagued with heavily processed food outlets, such as dollar stores, fast food chains, and convenience stores. Um, I know that there was an article written here recently around how dollar stores 
do their marketing um, analysis and they come into low wealth and minority communities. But when I was getting my doctorate in Irvine, there are alternatives that could be implemented here or in the Southern area or any rural areas if there is the political will involved, right? There's something called um, dollar general markets that have fresh produce in them. They have access to um, organic meats, but yet and still when we lobbied and advocated for that to happen here in Savannah, it was told to us that that couldn't happen. So I know as a planner that I believe that food apartheid is by design and it's not ironic or happenstance that the descendants of, um, of formerly enslaved Africans lived in these areas. And these are areas where there are high issues of pollutants, um, chronic illnesses that are dire related, but also um, airborne like asthma. Um, these are communities that we have to fight off environmental injustices. If you know anything about Savannah, it's a sleepy town on the Southeast coast. But when you take a look back and peel back some of the layers, the injustices that happen in communities that are near and dear to me are the ones that are facing all of the disproportionate effects of um, health related and diet related illnesses. Um, coupled with wealth inequities, many of my sisters and brothers do not have the same time to prepare healthy meals and they rely on what's fast and easy. And unfortunately, that normally comes in the forms of greasy, um, greasy foods, um, foods full of sodium um, that are sugary, sugary and heavily processed. Um, as a person with lived expertise, I like to set the stage and tell anyone that I have been in the same situation and that I'm no better than the clients and the people that I serve. Um, as a young mother, um, my oldest son is not, bi oldest biological son is 19 years old. So I had him my sophomore year of college. Um, and I was busy with life, work, school. Um, my husband was in the military. He was off on duties. And I had to do what was easy. While I had a support system, sometimes I did not like to ask because I didn't want to bother people. So unfortunately, it led to me becoming morbidly obese. I used to weigh over 300 pounds and I just got to a place where I was tired. I couldn't live like that. I couldn't run behind my boys anymore. It was just so exasperating and drastically affected my health. And so I said, I know that I needed to make a change. Well, the universe will make a change for you if you don't. And unfortunately I had to quit my job because my moral was my morals would not allow me to stay in the, the, per, the role that I was in at the moment. And so while that created some other challenges, my health was able to flourish. I was able to get to a healthy weight. I was able to maintain it and be stable. I was able to run behind my children and play soccer with them. But that took real initiative and real thought. And when I think about what my counterparts um, may be having challenges, there are, like I said, food apartheid areas. There's no access. Maybe they don't have a car to get to the grocery store. And that's not a realistic option for them. So they just have to do what's easy. And right now at the Foresight Farmers Market, we're doing our best to make the healthy choice the easy choice. Um, I like how the young lady talked about being a disruptor. Ironically, I named the Wi-Fi code, um, Wi-Fi in my house disruptor because I'm here to dismantle the systems of oppression. And I know that it's heavy lifting and I can't do it by myself. But there are all these myths that talk about why people are unhealthy. So as a researcher and analyst, I like to talk about the numbers. Um, so right here we see the vast majority of those experiencing hunger are in vulnerable populations. These are people that normally can't take care of themselves. Um, we have children that make up at least 41% of those 
who are, are con considered in hunger and 10% are seniors. So over half of those populations uh, experiencing hunger are in populations that really cannot have the ability to serve themselves. So I'm not certain what your school of thought is, but personally, I push back on the notion of a stomach full is a stomach full. My body tells me when I need to eat something different, when it's time for a salad or a smoothie or water uh, or a nutritious meal. So therefore, I believe in this space, we have to be intentional in what we provide to those who are experiencing hunger and poverty. Um, previous, in a previous role, I was able to help our local food banks, food pantries and soup kitchens um, with their procurement processes and work directly with local farmers to provide fresh produce to the food banks and food pantries and soup kitchens. So therefore, I challenge all my peers that work in these spaces to elevate their work to ensure that they promote the healthy options to their clients. I applaud the, the efforts of our local food bank here in Savannah. Um, one thing that we have used is a fresh express model. So all of the fresh produce that we, we get from local farmers, grocery stores, or growers, it is donated to um, nonprofit organizations and it is given away um, weekly to the community. Um, and I also think about those students, uh, you know, who are going hungry during the summer because of the long break. The statistics show that seven, six out of seven students are hungry over the summer because they don't have the summer meals or the school, I mean, the school meals, breakfast and lunch. And as we can see that lately, the administration rolled back um, where um, free lunch that was accessible to all has, has been um, transitioned out. And so we're also seeing where families are not turning in the school um, nutrition applications. And as an organization, we work with parents to make that easy. We help them to um, do SNAP renewals applications as well as school lunch forms um, because SNAP is a means to help quell hunger. And regardless of what some of people may think, only 2% of the whole federal budget is allocated towards SNAP. So you just think about that 2%. You know, in a country that is, uh, we're experiencing inflation, but we have not experienced real lack, right? So if we could, you know, make a charge to expand some of the PEBT benefits, I know that that was handled on the state level. Unfortunately, we lost ours, but there are some more forward thinking um, states that continued theirs on. Um, to provide these benefits to families, we're able to help quell hunger. Um, but what I found interesting about this data is that while Blacks represent 21% of all of those who are, are experiencing hunger or poverty, we're only, we only make up 26% of all SNAP re recipients. And then conversely, while 8% of all experiencing hunger and poverty are white, that accounts for 37% of those who are receiving SNAP benefits. So, um, you know, this is a hard topic to talk about, but that notion that Black people are lazy and don't want to do something for themselves, this dispels that right there. Um, I grew up in a household that my grandmother was very proud. So um, if we were, felt, we were to fall on hard times, I doubt very seriously she would ever have, um, you know, done a SNAP application. But it also shows that SNAP benefits, um, as a person that someone has utilized SNAP benefits, um, most of these people, especially my community, is using these benefits towards food. Um, sometimes our benefits didn't even stretch at that moment. So I was so fortunate to have a, a support system to rally around me to ensure that we were able to have balanced meals.
And the topic that we are here to focus on is research methods. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, a majority of different research methods. Um, the ones that I prefer um, personally are the socio-ecological model. Um, I use this in my practices and tools because it looks at the individual level, which you know talks about how is this one situation affecting one person? Um, so the question is, is to me was how is a, living in a food apartheid area, it, you know, affecting one person, right? It is probably affecting them in a rate, uh, in, a, in a manner where they're not able to take care of themselves and eat, be able to access healthy foods. But if it's a child, this should always look at the household finances, right? Because they're not taking care of themselves. Um, then on the second level, it's a relationship level. I like to look at it as a familiar level. Um, one study that I did was on how uh, the lack of healthy food options in a household affected a child's behavior at school. I was able to look at you know, behavioral situations um, that occurred in school. And it was because children couldn't focus because they're eating sugary diets. They're, they are lacking the nutrition, um, dense foods that um, normally would occur in another household. And then you talk about the relationship because the family is doing, if one child is ha uh, having this problem, then everyone else in the household is having the problem, right? So the parent possibly is not able to, there to be there to provide these meals. And then also on the communal level, which I look at the neighborhood, then how, other, how many other families are experiencing this? Um, I'll give you an example. Here in West Savannah, um, uh, Savannah, Georgia, um, it, it's about 25,000 people there, but you have enclaves of 80 to 90% poverty while the city of Savannah um, has a 30% poverty rate. So that means that there are many households who are living in food apartheid areas that cannot effectively feed their children nutrient dense meals. They're going to schools and they're being labeled troublemakers because of issues that they cannot control. And then let's talk about local government, right? The societal level, um, I, I'm going to talk about local government as opposed to national at this moment. We have a majority um, African-American council and yet and still there has not been done enough to address food apartheid areas. I work in the space where I contract out with convenience stores to provide fresh produce in stores. Um, we also have a mobile farmer's market we have the 912 food pharmacy program, but yet and still that's not enough, right? Um, I think Dr. Kofi spoke about the political will and the political will must be coupled with genuine intentions where policymakers or elected officials and leaders stick to what they need to do as far as moving the needle forward to address these areas. And so therefore we see that hunger has a ripple effect. It doesn't just affect one household, it affects you as well. Um, I like to talk about um, equating it to money, right? In Savannah, locally, we could have saved $31 million in unnecessary hospital visits if there had been done more in food in addressing food and nutrition insecurity. You just think about what you could have done, what we could have done with $31 million. We could have eliminated uh, some of the debt that is incurred um, to our farmers if we help them with rotational crops. We could have had families to be able to financially sustain themselves where they can afford the foods themselves. Um, and so that is a large number in a city of about 150,000 people where over 55% are black. Then I moved to participatory research. 
Number one, participatory research must be community led. Um, I heard my colleagues talk about um, the community knows what they need. If you want to know what someone needs, just ask them. They'll be more than happy to oblige you and tell you what they need. Because it's not about us, it's about serving the community and meeting the need to ensure that the next generation does not have to have these issues. Um, and listening is pertinent. I tell anyone, I take off all of these letters off behind my name and I'm just Deidre. The highest thing that I can ever be called is sister. I don't need the doctor. I just need my community to be good. And so listening and listening to genuinely affect change is what's needed. Um, I live in a household where um, I have some wonderful people, i.e. my oldest son who's studying to be a lawyer. He listens to come up with a response. But listening and sitting back and fully digesting what people are saying, as well as listening to their thoughts on how to remedy it, that's what we have to fully engage. And I tell anyone, lived experience trumps all theories, case studies, anything that you can think of, because that is what is important. At the end of the day, I... I could not do this work without having walked the shoes that I have walked in. I could not do this work without my ancestors being able to propel this work and magnify this work so that I have some kind of foundation. And so therefore the next generation I am excited about because when they have people such as others on this panel, they're able to come into a space where it is welcomed and understood that a bottoms up approach, approach must be utilized. Um, we live in a top down society where everyone at the bottom gets the crumbs, but it's the people who were at the bottom should be the first at the table. I, um, I, I practice acid-based acid community development when I work in ivory, the ivory base sphere because you can go throughout a community and see how to build upon what they need financially and economically to incentivize and, and effect change even in the hunger sphere. And then next focus groups. These are ways and opportunities to engage and build lasting, genuine and sustaining relationships. Relationships that transcend even me leaving the space. I share a story about Miss Annette Archie who recently passed. Miss Annette Archie was one of our strongest supporters. And she ensured that every community member that she knew, knew about the farm truck, knew about food pharmacy, as well as saying, oh, you can trust Deidre. You can trust Tasha. You can trust Mark. Because she knew that word of mouth spoke volumes as opposed to an ad on a TV or on a bus. In my community, it is about who are your people. That's how they know to trust you. They know what your genuine, your intentions are. And people can read through the lines. They can tell if you are just scripted or if it's honest. Um, also with focus groups, they build and cultivate a judgment-free zone. I like to let everyone know that I am no better than the next. I have been in these positions and I'm here to listen as to what I can do to assist you out of the position. So therefore, we start off with a shared meal. We start off with being vulnerable and transparent while staying professional. And then we also move to having listening sessions and asking probative questions after hearing what has been said. And when they see their peers that are, sh are sharing, then they are more likely to share. We also hear that families are able to, excuse me, families are able to share and more likely to share 
when they feel that this is a safe space. So anything that Forsyth Farmers Market does, anything that Deidre does, it is with the notion that what is said here stays here. And here recently, we have been able to do some more, um, do work within the Hispanic community. And that came about utilizing relationships that were already built in the community. I am not of Hispanic descent. So therefore I relied on my peers that had built relationships to welcome me into their spaces. I never walk into a community thinking this is my space, regardless of if I'm black or not. Um, people here in Savannah, especially in the Gullah Geechee um, community will tell you, don't come here if you ain't from here, right? So there's a come here and a from here. So I'm grateful that I am a from here. Um, but when I moved to Savannah, I had to build relationships with people who were from here so that I would be welcome in those spaces. So this is what I continue to underscore. And then I get into the space of those areas that are questionable. Um, personally, uh, surveys are a necessary tool in elevating and progressing the work. Um, unfortunately, like uh, Fanika was saying earlier, um, just handing out a piece of paper and a, or, or, or a tablet is not gonna do it. You have to build a relationship in order for someone to answer your questions properly or and not be resistant. Um, we all know that data can be skewed. Therefore, if you want true and honest answers, the relationship building is key to, to getting those honest answers. Um, I have been <laughs> on the other side of things where you give a piece of, I've been given a piece of paper and I just jot down anything because I just want to keep on going. But if we are really intentional about the work and, and in ensuring that a data is sound, then we build relationships while giving our surveys. Ethnographies. I am a proponent of ethnographies. Matter of fact, um, that helped me through my thesis and uh, while I was working on my urban and regional planning degree masters. Um, but the researcher must understand the culture uh, or be culturally competent or be directly from the community. If not, some of the practices would not be understood. And so therefore they could be demonized. Um, we have seen this in um, African traditional religions um, and how that those were used as a tool to sustain slavery, right? Um, these are not, uh, these are not ways to, these are not ways that we want to continue on, right? We want to shift um, the narrative. And unfortunately, experimentation in the black community, that has not always gone well. We know the story of the Tuskegee experiment. We know the mosquito, uh, you all may not know about the mosquito experimentation here in Savannah, but, um, it was where the military came in, in West Savannah and let uh, mosquitoes out to figure out if malaria or any other diseases would be prevalent in African-American communities. So we have been, unfortunately, the subjects of uh, atrocities um, and such as James Marion and his um, experimentation on black women while he is still considered dubbed the, the designer of, uh, of gynecology. These are atrocities that um, continue to affect and traumatize black people, even to the point where we've seen there's this mistrust in um, receiving uh, the COVID vaccines. So if we want to ensure that our methods are sound and our methods are just and our methods are honorable, um, more personally, I move towards utilizing um, the focus groups and socio-ecological models and participatory research. Um, but there are ways to couple um, or, or work in these other spheres, whether it be sur surveys, ethnographies, or experiments, but it will take a lot of relationship building and, and trust um, to move forward.
So um, I had the pleasure of happening um, into the public health sphere um, while I was studying um, for my master's in public policy and um, urban planning. And so I went back to school after receiving a doctorate to get an MPA with a concentration in public health. My husband thought I was crazy, but I knew I needed to understand it. I had a few classes, but I saw where the upstream approach is what needed to happen. And so I like to talk about the root causes of hunger first, right? Um, hunger is systemic and hunger is multifaceted. We've heard that today. Um, listening to everyone's presentations, I was uh, so happy to know that I'm not the only one who is experiencing some of the same issues, but seeing these overarching themes and they continue to work together in tandem. But I suggest that we use the social determinants of health as a guide so that we can truly combat and eradicate hunger. Um, and number one, until we address the wealth gap and access to income, generation, income generating resources and opportunities, we'll continue to perpetuate the same cycle of nutrition insecurity. Um, we live in a capitalist society, therefore low wealth families need more opportunities to entrepreneurship and high income generating employment. Um, there have been conversations about raising the minimum wage but that's not that's not all in all, right? Um, because with inflation, we're seeing that depending upon the household size and location of where you live, fifteen dollars isn't going to go far. It's more like thirty dollars as a starting point. But we do understand that that may not be reasonable. But if we want to truly address hunger, and we have to tackle the issue of lack of access to capital and funding opportunities. Then we can talk about the access to healthy food outlets. Um, I purposely use this map um, in this slide because it only accounts for supermarkets and those who do not have cars. Public transportation in the South is usually less consistent and stable, even in urban areas. Um, I know that when we first moved here to Savannah, I had to wait two hours for a bus. After living in California, I was like, this is insane. I'm not doing this. And I asked my husband to go get a second vehicle. We were able to live in California with one car, but that is not optimal here. So therefore there needs to be done and to ensure that the grocery store also is not the silver bullet. Um, we need to take into account that not all people have access to um, vehicular transportation, because biking and, and more walkable spaces is really the way to move because that gives physical activity coupled with um, healthy food outlets. We're able to create that and cultivate a healthy weight within our community. Um, I'm not here just to promote farmer's markets because I lead one, but I'm a proponent of open air markets, period. Um, I know where my food is coming from. I know Farmer Joe, I know Farmer Helen, I know Farmer Adam. I know what their practices look like. And I can't always say that about grocery stores. While I know some of my farmers do um, vend to our um, local grocery stores, I believe in these small local settings because there is economic generation that goes directly back into the community which they serve. So therefore my money is in a circular pattern because it's moving from my hand to my farmers, back to their workers, back into our food system and into the local restaurants and uh, other uh, outlets here, even our hospital system. So I look at creating generational wealth and a farmer's market can be used as a tool to do that. The grocery store unfortunately continues to support the Big Ten. And we know at the end of the day, the Big Ten is not in business to help the, the small farmer. And as someone who is an educator and, a, and an academic, 
I believe that education is imperative, right? Educating our community on why we're eating seasonally, locally sourced food, and how does that benefit their health? And how is that better for them is what we have to do. Um, also educating that the community that healthy eating does not have to be expensive. There is this thought that healthy eating is expensive but it does not have to be. I'm grateful that at our market, we double SNAP benefits, but we also meet people where they are. So some of our farmers have this um, pay what you can model. So we don't look at to price gouge. We don't look at um, inflation and, and, and gouging people because we know that everyone is hurting at this place. And we use education as a tool to build community and relationships. Um, that has made sure that we're successful in ensuring that our community is first. And our community informs our education, whether it be recipes, whether it be food demos, our classes, anything that we do here, we hear first from the community. And I'd like to underscore right here that all of these systems that I previously mentioned, um, they breed crime, unfortunately. My husband is former military and law enforcement. So therefore he and I have had many conversations with those who have been incarcerated um, and, and that are currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. And most convey that they committed crimes because they cannot, could not take care of their families. More specifically, feed their children. I have had gentlemen break down to me and explain to me that they resorted to a crime because they rather take the risk of being able to provide some financial benefit to support their families than to not do anything at all. And as a mother, mother I shudder to think what that really would look like. If we were in a position, if I was in the position to have to make that choice. Um, I was fortunate to have that support system and I provide that support system to everyone who I come in contact. But if I didn't have people rally around me, I don't know where I would have been. Um, and I always talk about being proactive, right? Using the public health lens um, teaches us to be proactive and work towards prevention. Um, as stated before, nutrition insecurity is most multifaceted. So we have to build strong relationships with community members, organizations, elected officials, and funders to support the work. And when we're talking about funding, our research and our data is what drives funders to even support the work more. They want to know about their impact. They want to know where their dollars are spent. And so therefore, when we're getting accurate and true data, we're able to say, hey, this is where your money went and we're able to sustain this work and continue it on. And genuine interactions. I like to look people in the eye. I like to smile, but I like to be honest. I like to always present myself as humble and make sure that I am interacting appropriately. And I like to also advocate um, for funding uh, for our farmers, co-ops and farmers markets. Um, that way we can address the racial inequities. So I would be remiss if I didn't leave you with some actionable item, um, items. And as you all know, I work for the Foresight Farmers Market. We're known for our flagship market that happens rain or sun, uh, rain or shine every Saturday in the middle of Savannah um, from nine to one. And we ensure that we um, even leave our space with food from our farmers if they brought more than enough. We take that back, we aggregate it and put it back in the community on not just our farm truck, but here recently we started a community share box program and it's called a farm share box. And I'm proud of it because it retails at between 40 and $50, but we only charge our community $10 a box and they're able to use their SNAP benefits towards that, as well as our food pharmacy program. We started off with around 170 members. Unfortunately, because of the situation that we're in, we have over 550 people enrolled in our food pharmacy program. 
And that's in less than nine months time. But we make sure that we meet everyone at our stops. We work with partner organizations um, within the healthcare field to give those grips off um, our participants. And we're able to um, give them their produce at the, at the end of our clinics, as well as giving them education. And the farm truck, we currently have 12 stops, um, specifically in low wealth communities. We're expanding to 24 here before the year is out because the need is so dire. And as you can see, the education and outreach never stops. We have garden initiatives where we work with um, our uh, school system and bring the school, um, bring the garden to the schools as well. And I know that I am running out of time, so I want to leave you with the last few things, right? So health services, food is medicine. Our food pharmacy program is a tool that can be utilized and replicated nationwide to ensure that households have what they need in the form of food as medicine um, and keeping down that $31 million of unnecessary um, hospital vi visits. Um, program developments around the education and access, ADAWA, which stands for a taste of old African heritage, where we teach the community about the culturally um, appropriate foods that our ancestors ate and get back to those old food ways and heritages and practices that they did to sustain themselves. I will leave you with one thing as well. My grandmother, when she passed last year on my birthday, even though she had the audacity to leave on my birthday, she was 105. She was not on any medications. She was not on, uh, only thing she did was she walked with a walker. So I know that this works as a tool. And our food is medicine has been shown that, um, our 912 food pharmacy has been shown that um, some of our participants have gotten off their diabetic medicines their um, high cholesterol medicines just by utilizing the program. And policy and advocacy go a long way. Um, I'm so grateful that we have FRAC and Georgia, Organiza um, Georgia Organics as collaborator collaborators in this work because they're able to lobby our um, elected officials and talk about the issues that are going on here specifically in low wealth communities and in Georgia. Um, and also underscoring that research is imperative and research is key. But we also must use that as, as, as in pillar five says, to enhance our nutrition and food security research relationship cultivation is a must. So I hope everyone I was able to bring some new thoughts after all of the wonderful participants before me stole my thunder, but I was so happy to hear that I am in great company in this work. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Grimm. Um, I really appreciate that talk and it was a wonderful conclusion. And we do have some time for some really awesome questions that we have in the chat. Um, so you talked about using the African Heritage Food Pyramid with the population that you're serving, but have you ever taught that or, or provided education on the African Heritage Food Pyramid with those outside of the population that you serve so people are understanding of what that looks like? That's a great question. Um, so one thing that we definitely work um, in Spears is that we believe that we cannot do this work without our allies and accomplices in this work. Um, the founders of the, this market um, where I think it was, it was six women, of course, you always ask the woman to get a job done. Um, one was black, five are, are, are white, and they are the ones who pushed that we looked at the African um, heritage food pyramid. And so we work with local chefs to replicate these in their classes. Um, our classes are open to all um, our food, uh, our 912 food pharmacy, we replicate these models there. And so we do have um, people in our spaces that are not of um, African descent um, to that take part in these classes. So short answer, yes, 
because we understand that this method has to be replicated, especially living in um, Savannah. So yes, we um, definitely educate the community um, far and wide about these. Yes, and to your point of saying, you know, your grandmother living to the age that she lived to, when we look at kind of the research around the blue zones, it's diet. It is diet that helps us live to an old age. And then I kind of look at where, where my grandmother's at. She's in her early eighties and not doing so hot, but I also look at the, the food choices that she had access to and that she ate during her life and how maybe if there was something she did differently with her nutrition, that maybe that would help prolong and the quality and quantity of her life. And so that really struck home to me when you were saying that, um, and how we can educate others on traditional cultures and how they're eating and how that promotes health because food is medicine. Um, but we also had um, a question from Famika, one of the panelists, and she asked, do you practice the art of Sankofa within your community and those who want to work with you? <laughs> I need to stay out my head. Um, so yes, we do. Um, and can you explain what that is for those in the audience who don't know? So Sankofa looks um, at the principle of going back to where we came from, to go and uh, looking forward to where we're going. Um, and so I think that that's a more generational approach, right? So um, as you can see, my daughter's here in the office and I know you all heard the noise back here. So I please forgive me, but we, take the garden, we take our young people to the garden with us, we take our young people on farm tours, we take our young people to the farmer's market and help them understand that farming can be a lucrative career. There is this thought that farming is only for people who are destitute um, and they are not going to make any money. But we have farm vendors, even black farm vendors that make three, at least three million dollars specifically at our farm our farmer's market alone. Yes, you heard me right. Did $3 million. I told, I told my husband, I was like, we got to get back home because I'm in the wrong business. I need to be at the market generating <laughs> money. But just to say, um, yes, we definitely, you know, make sure that we remember where we came from and make sure that the next generation has those tools to move forward. Um, because what worked for our ancestors definitely can be replicated and work for us. Um, it is just, uh, it, it takes a lot of heavy lifting. And I know she understands that um, because it is, it's, it's not as prevalent as it was. And it's, and it's so very hurtful to me, but um, we have, I, I take a garden everywhere I go. Unfortunately, every house that I've lived in, the people that move in, they move in with a garden. Um, here at the farmer's market, I'm in the office right now. Um, there's a young lady who has a farm outside. Um, we have farms next door and we offer grants and opportunities for farming. So some of our, um, also some of our chefs, they, are, um, they farm and they educate um, the community on how to farm as well too. That is really amazing because if you, I know when we talk to kids, like elementary school kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? A doctor, a lawyer, an astronaut, you know, all the things, but you never hear farmer. And if we could show kids how that is a sustainable and, you know, practical job that they can have and they can make more money uh, than some of those professions, um, it might help kind of change that mindset. Like you said, you, we tend to think of farmers as like they have to because there's no other option. Um, and that's really powerful is showing kids that that's an option when they grow up if they want to be a farmer. Um, so I think that's fabulous. Um, and I, there was another question, and I'm not sure what state the, this participant is in, but she asked if your farm truck accepts WIC because they're having a really hard time getting their farm truck vendor to accept WIC because of state regulations. We're in the same position here. Um, unfortunately, um, Georgia is not as forward thinking as I would like them to be. Um, 
in California, we were able to do that easily. Um, we've moved to uh, the card here in Georgia. And so one of the things that I did approach our senators Warnock and Ossoff on was helping us to be able to take that off of our farmers. Um, our WIC vouchers can only be used directly with um, some of our farm vendors which they have said that they do not want that burden. And so as a market, since we already handle SNAP, it would make it you know, a seamless uh, transition to do so. And so um, maybe you and I, we can coordinate on how we can lobby to make sure that that happens because um, we are losing, uh, we're losing out not just on, um, funds funding for our farmers, but access to food for our participants. And I am a trained CLC, so I believe in breastfeeding. And one thing that I want to do is create a mama's market here. It's been replicated in Louisiana and other states in the Gulf Coast. And we need to do that here as well. I love that. And as maternal and child health people that we are. I'm very happy that you said that. I actually just spent all, all morning at our breastfeeding symposium, so I'm so glad you said that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have someone that's actually in South Carolina, <laughs> and she asked what your coverage area is because she's trying to find resources for their patients. Sure. Um, if you could ask her specifically where she's in South Carolina. Medical University oh. in South Carolina. So she's, in, she's back home in Charleston. Um, so a lot of our farmers do um, come from um, the Charleston area. Um, so I'm quite sure that there's something that we can work out to, um, you know, expand food pharmacy. Um, what we are trying to do is bridge a gap between uh, maybe the Charleston, Walterboro area to extend all the way to Brunswick. Um, here recently, we have been uh, notified that we are considered a food hub. And so our work is expanding. So I would definitely love to partner um, with her um, as well as one of my favorite dietitians is at the USC. So I have great respect for them there. Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure that participant, um, I found you on LinkedIn, so I'm sure they can find you on LinkedIn and connect and, and get some conversation going. But I just wanted to thank you so much for ending us on a very wonderful note um, and really sharing that insight with us. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You all yes. Have and now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Emily Holloway for our call of action.